I struggle to speak to you today because I'm not sure what words are appropriate when discussing this issue. However, if you can't hear the whole truth, you will never know true empathy. And I believe in the saying, if we have to live through it, then you should have to hear it. On February 27th of 2018, actress Evan Rachel Wood testified in front of a House Judiciary Subcommittee in Washington, D.C. to advocate for the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights Act to be extended to all 50 states. Wood detailed harrowing accounts of abuse and torture that she endured at the hands of an ex-partner, and while she hadn't named her abuser directly, many had speculated that she was likely referring to infamous mall goth shock rock artist Marilyn Manson, who had begun dating Wood when she was just 18 years old and he was well into his late 30s. On February 1st of 2020, Wood took to her Instagram directly and confirmed that Manson was indeed her abuser, calling him out by his legal name in the post. This prompted several other survivors of Manson's abuse to come forward and detail their own accounts of instances where Manson had allegedly groomed, harassed, and assaulted them. Manson was promptly dropped by his record label and management, and despite the backlash that inevitably came the survivor's way for publicly speaking out against their abuser, there was also overwhelming support. In June of 2020, SoCal Garage Rock record label Burger Records met its demise over allegations of misconduct and enablement of abuse by leadership at the label with their all-ages shows. The nail in the coffin was when Lydia Knight from indie surf rock band The Regrets publicly accused Joey Armstrong from the band Swimmers of sexually assaulting, manipulating, and grooming her when he was an adult and she was under 18. This pattern and cycle clearly speaks to an unfortunate truth about the rock and roll lifestyle's historical ongoing glorification of unlimited access to women's bodies and exploitation of underage fans, and as demonstrated by the Burger Record case, this vicious cycle is still in full swing. However, when the incident happened, many average music consumers were still baffled and dumbfounded. But to Jessica Hopper, the famed music critic and award-winning reporter, this was just a Tuesday for her. Historically within music for male artists, particularly women's bodies, particularly young women's bodies, have been seen as their right that it is a reward for playing a good show, etc. That it is, it is part of what power can get you in these spaces, which is access to women, dominion over women in particular. Though it's, it, 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 obviously it isn't uh, limited to uh, just women who, who are subject to this predation. So we can't yet attempt to, quote, solve this problem when as a community, as an industry, we haven't even really acknowledged or examined the historical scale of sexual abuse. A lot of great artists that we put on a pedestal and view as heroes have historically done pretty horrific things that we would objectively consider unethical, including stealing from less privileged artists, racism, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, and misogyny. But we can't imagine letting go of the incredible experiences or periods in our lives that we associate with these works of art. It is also incredibly common in the art world for creators to have engaged in incredibly predatory behavior, manipulation, and even physical and emotional abuse. We have seen Me Too hit the film industry and have publicly condemned many high-profile figures, and yet it must also be said that the same clearly doesn't go for bosses and CEOs who are still enabling cycles of abuse that cause their employees severe emotional distress and in most extreme cases end up having to be taken to court. And with all the Hollywood high-profile cases, here we are almost five years later and the big fat looming question still persists. What about the music industry? I think that there's a whole lot to unpack, for starters. But let's look at the historical context for a second. It is no secret that the music industry is disproportionately run by men. It's pretty common knowledge. Only 1.8% of music producers happen to be women. And as if that weren't disappointing enough, you ask any woman, including incredibly powerful key female figures in music, both behind the scenes and at the forefront, what their experiences have been like 
95% of them are likely to have at least one horror story of abuse that they had to suffer and endure at the hands of their male colleagues. When it comes to abusive artists who are still alive today, like R. Kelly, Chris Brown, Ryan Adams, Marilyn Manson, or any band affiliated with Burger Records for that matter, the situation is much less sticky than with artists who are no longer alive. Because these musicians are still around and still profiting, there is definitely an argument to be made that consuming their art is unethical because we are indirectly allowing them to continue funding their abusive lifestyles. As Maeve McDermott wrote, for me, there's no way I can consume music made by alleged abusers and not feel like I'm part of the problem. Like I'm just another listener choosing to ignore the reports against the artist and continue to pay them money and attention while upholding the power structure that contributes to these crimes happening in the first place. Whether that means choosing not to stream an R. Kelly song or including a footnote of Michael Jackson allegations when I write about his undeniably beloved catalog, these actions take a conscious effort and I'm working to get better at being more conscientious. Music is a terrifyingly powerful artistic medium. It accompanies us throughout our lives and we associate the music we love with our fondest moments in life. But it doesn't go unnoticed that many of these artists who have made some of the most lauded and critically beloved music of all time have also engaged in behavior that no decent human being should ever endorse or excuse. But at what point does it become a social responsibility to not only hold an artist responsible, but also acknowledge when separating the art from the artist is just a faulty excuse to avoid reckoning with this truth and taking responsibility for being part of the problem? We are now living in a culture where Me Too has become a global movement and the backlash to the movement has also been just as swift. Have you ever noticed that most of the people who crow the loudest about quote unquote cancel culture and witch hunts are often the same people who refuse to take accountability for their own questionable behavior? Now here's where it also gets complicated. Is it ethical to stream music that puts money into the pockets of musicians whose behavior has demonstrated that they are not trustworthy? It honestly depends on the context. They say don't meet your idols. But I also find the growing conversation around the pitfalls of celebrity worship and the consumer a touch ironic. No matter how much we claim in a 140 character tweet that idol worship is bad, we also seem incredibly reluctant to admit the many ways in which the consumer is culpable for contributing to this type of worship. Stan culture is at its peak in the current digital climate and it's showing no signs of disappearing as long as the internet is around. And while we're on the topic of stan culture, this may also be a good time to bring up how stan culture can also contribute to the unethical consumption of music indirectly. For example, earlier this summer, it was announced that the late R&B songstress Aaliyah would finally have her music released to streaming platforms after her uncle Barry Hankerson, the founder and CEO of Black Round Records, struck up a new distribution deal with streaming services. Aaliyah stands rapidly took to Twitter with the hashtag Aaliyah is coming. However, despite the widespread celebration and excitement from fans, it's also been well documented that Hankerson is an extremely sinister figure. Not only was it Hankerson who introduced Aaliyah to R. Kelly, a man who repeatedly abused and groomed his niece and nearly derailed her life and career, but Hankerson continued to work with Kelly after the fact and has also exploited several other artists on the Black Round roster before the record label inevitably went bankrupt. After Hankerson's seemingly out of nowhere deal with streaming services was announced, Aaliyah's family and estate swiftly came out with a statement claiming that they were not informed of this deal and would not financially benefit from it, calling Hankerson and his colleagues individuals who have emerged from the shadows to leech off of Aaliyah's life's work. Now, don't get me wrong, I will certainly be streaming Aaliyah's catalog myself as well because like many my age, I never had access to the CDs. But I also count myself among the people who are 
just a smidge hesitant to celebrate this given her uncle's history and shady business tactics. And this illustrates a larger issue in the conversation. Putting together an album and releasing it to the public requires many hands, and how are we supposed to know that everybody involved in making a record is 100% unproblematic? Well, you can't. I mean, you can certainly try, but I doubt anyone has the time to comb through the liner notes of every single record they own. And what about label personnel and producers? Current pop stars like Doja Cat and Kim Petras have worked with Dr. Luke. Does that mean we ought to cut them out of our listening patterns as well? That's not really for me to decide. It's an extremely complex issue. There also seems to be a lack of responsibility taken by consumers who are angry now, who were blissfully oblivious before. For example, no matter how openly his crimes of pedophilia and human trafficking were documented in the press, the majority of public opinion was not necessarily against R. Kelly until Dream Hampton's lifetime documentary, Giving a Voice to His Survivors, aired in 2018. As recently as 2013, Kelly had headlined Pitchfork Festival to little dissent, except for his survivors, activist groups led by black women, and music critic and Chicago Sun-Times reporter Jim DeRogatis. And DeRogatis made an excellent point in his conversation with Jessica Hopper in The Village Voice. It's not that there weren't people who were speaking out against this man, it's just that they were not being heard. I think it was a lot of things, including the fact that Kelly was fully capable of intimidating people. These girls feared for their lives. They feared for the safety of their families. And these people talked to me not because I'm super reporter. We rang a lot of doorbells on the south and west sides, and people were eager to talk about this guy because they wanted him to stop. As Tyler Coates wrote for Esquire, it's time to stop separating the art from the artist, even if I understand the impulse to do so. After all, no one wants to see their hero revealed to be someone not so heroic. You're not a bad person for appreciating the art created by an abuser, especially since these details are often hidden out of sight from the consumer. But it's different from when you prioritize whatever that person has created. A movie, a TV show, a song, over the real people that they have allegedly victimized because you are more attached to what they have created than open to believing the numerous allegations against the creator. And I fully agree with his assertion. Nobody should be placing their trust in their favorite artist. And we must also distance ourselves from the binary mode of thinking that leads to the assertion this artist has done bad things, therefore consuming their art also makes the consumer a bad person. That is not only incorrect, but also an incredibly reductive way of looking at a situation that is much more nuanced. For example, Casey Fassett, a jazz musician and saxophone player who I recently had on my podcast, made an excellent point in our conversation about why, as a jazz musician, it has become necessary for her to divorce the work from the artist themselves. In jazz, like, especially as a woman in jazz, like, you have to divorce the work from the person so much. Like, I mean, you turn 12 and you get handed like a Charlie Parker omnibook. You know, and it's like, you have to learn how to play like Charlie Parker, like he was the king of, king of bebop. Like you have to, you can't just write off Charlie Parker and be like, he was a sexist, I'm not gonna do this. But he was, he was like a terrible person. He did a ton of drugs, he was extremely sexist. Like he was a very bad person and especially to women. But I can't be like, on feminine principles, I refuse to learn a Charlie Parker bebop solo. Like you can't do that. Like it's just not a thing you can do. And I'm not saying that like, I can't learn it and still acknowledge that he was a bad person because I can, but like I grew up having to be like that, you know? I grew up having to be like, yeah, that person was not a good person, but like their music has value. So I've always had to grow up like that. So by the time I got to like pop music like that, I was already used to having like to divorce the person from the, the art, you know? And it's like, it's not like, you know, I'll listen to Japanese hot house and I don't have to do that. But you know, I'll listen to Smith and I'll be like, yeah, like, so Morrissey like turned into a caricature of himself, but like it doesn't mean I can't listen to I Know It's Over and be like, this is a good song, you know? Um, but again, that's like, I know some people might disagree with that. I feel like a lot of it is because of how I grew up in jazz music. Like there's just no 
if you had to take out every like sexist or like disgusting jazz person like you would have like 30 percent of the music left like that's just kind of how that scene was and how those people were you know and like think about all like the white guys who plays jazz who played jazz who were like probably pretty good but were also probably like racist like there's just so many bad people and i'm not saying that to like get down or anything it's just that like i don't know it's really hard to find music that is like in the past that is like really really high quality and the people that make it are 100 unproblematic because people were being held accountable for stuff back then yeah there is generally a collective cynicism about the possibility of any positive change coming to the music industry when we feel guilty for continuing to enjoy the work of artists who have done bad things, we tend to over-rationalize and suppress these feelings through cognitive dissonance. When we talk about artists like David Bowie, John Lennon, James Brown, Lou Reed, Phil Spector, and Michael Jackson, those tend to be the cases where separating the art from the artist can be less difficult, because not only are most of them already dead, but they also came up in a time where that type of behavior was so commonplace that it's near impossible to consume any art from that time without the artists themselves having done problematic things. One of my favorite artists of all time, Nico, who I am planning on making a retrospective video on soon, so stay tuned for that. She is an incredibly talented musician, and I still worship her work to this day, whether it be through her tenure with the Velvet Underground, her later proto-gothic psalms composed on a harmonium. She has been responsible for some of my favorite music ever. But she was also incredibly racist. And that's something I normally have to be cognizant and mindful of when consuming her work. And then there's the sad, sad case of Bob Dylan. Yeah, unfortunately, all of our faves from the past just fucking suck. There's also one other looming issue that I haven't addressed yet, but it's pretty unavoidable. And that is the fact that separating the art from the artist is first and foremost a privilege. Those who have the privilege to dissociate from the fact that their favorite artists were abusive are often the same people who complain when less privileged people rightfully point out injustices and inexcusable behavior. As Sarah Ahmed so eloquently wrote in Feminist Killjoys, we can become even more conscious of the world in this process of becoming conscious of injustices because actually we have been taught to overlook so much. We are taught not to notice what happens right in front of us. I think that there is nothing more challenging and potentially world-shattering than the recognition or consciousness of structure. Structures are reproduced by the very techniques that stop us from recognizing them. When pointing out these structures, we become sore points, because you are pointing out something that gets in the way of how people occupy space. Note as well, when you point out sexism, you are often blocked. Sometimes it seems as exhausting to notice sexism as it does to experience sexism. There's no escaping the plague of artists who are problematic, and unfortunately the most digestible way to deal with it is often through cognitive dissonance. But with more current artists, a lot of people often tend to be less lenient, as they should be. If I were to find out that an artist whose music I enjoy is still alive and well today and has been accused of some egregious behavior, I would have no problem dropping them tomorrow. However, I am also not here to preach or tell anybody else how they ought to be consuming their music based on my own ethical standards, because that would be a form of policing somebody else's consumption choices, which is also bad. As my friend Val, the founder of the amazing channel and blog Sets in the CD, wrote in one of her essays, there's a lot of vitriol on both sides of the issue. Tons of socially minded fans are now jaded and torn, dreading to listen to an artist's music and going on existential tirades about where art ends and personhood begins, and the more skeptic, edgier crowd who is eager to hop on the devil's advocate clout club, using this as an opportunity to connect with a burnt yet still undeniably extremely influential person, under the guise of not caring about the politics. Which is a more badass way of not being like other girls, I guess. It's a complex issue that affects people in different ways. 
it would be nice if we had an easy and direct answer for how to solve this inexplicably complex moral dilemma. But until all of us can collectively come up with a healthy strategy of how to reckon with this problem, we're pretty much left to leaving it up to the consumer.